Let's now see how these bivariate normal distributions can be used to represent uh, two clusters. So let's return to a, a problem that I, um, I talked about earlier. I called it the non-spherical Gaussian mixture back on page 17. Uh, so I'll um, just let me bring up R. This is the code that I had shown you back on page 17. <clears throat> the uh, idea is, is this. We're going to have a sigma. So let me show you sigma. We're going to have a correlation of 0.8 in, um, in, in one cluster. The other cluster is going to be spherical. So I go off and I generate... Um, we're going to generate... 100 observations from the black distribution. This black distribution is going to have a mean of, of 0, 0, and the variance is going to be 1. Uh, this red distribution, on the other hand, is going to have a mean of 0, but uh, there's going to be a correlation of 0 0.8, and um, yeah, equal variance in both directions. You can see that. All right, so then uh, the question is, can we recover this, this uh, distribution using, um, using mclust? So here's the call. We'll use mclust. Just give it the first two columns. g equal to 2 says, you know, give me only the first two uh, clusters. We want to extract two clusters. Now when we plot it, um, this is what we get. So we'll see that we've done a pretty good job of, of recovering those the, the, the two component distributions. Now if we look at the parameters, the estimated parameters, so it looks like it's about 50-50. That's exactly the way we generated it. Here are the means. So the correct means were 0, 0. And we're off by a little bit, but not much. And then 2, 0. I'm off by a little bit, but not, not that much. Uh, here's one correlation matrix, actually one covariance matrix. Uh, the covariances are, they should be zero, but they're not quite zero. And down here, um, we should find the correlation. So the only way I know how to find the correlation is to compute it. So let's take the covariance. So 1.109589 divided by the square root of 1.2589 times 1.42877. And so it's about 0.8. So it looks like we, we recovered that. Let's, uh, let's now look at the newspaper example that we've been following through. If we estimate the Gaussian mixture on this, we end up with a fairly complicated solution. It's very easy to see it on this, uh, this diagram. And what you'll see is that these ellipses are all quite different from each other. Um, so uh, the thing that leaps out is that they have uh, different orientation. So some of them are pointed, uh, you know, there's a negative association in that cluster. Looks like there's a positive association down in this group, and there's virtually no association in those top groups. I don't think this is a very good solution. Uh, there are some things that, that would be very difficult to explain. So, for example, consider this point up here. So this point is classified as a skimmer. We called that a skimmer the other day. Whereas these two points are heavy readers. So they all spend about the same time. However, if I read only you know five sections, I'm called heavy. If I read six, I'm called... Uh, a skimmer, if I read seven, I'm called heavy again. And so that's kind of hard to, de to defend. The, the, the reason for this is I, th I think because of the elongated cluster here and the, you know, the cluster that's elongated in a different, with a different orientation on the, the other side. Well, I think that we've, um, we've allowed too much flexibility in this model. So turns out that we can control this flexibility with uh, an additional set of parameters. All right, so we can add 
the model name to a fit and um, you know, get a slightly different fit. These are all the, the models that MCLUST will fit. This table comes directly out of uh, the, the paper that's referenced here. Now, to understand this, let's walk through um, the first two, then we're going to do the next four, and then I'm going to go real quickly over the last four. What we're going to do is decompose the, correlation, the covariance matrix into a couple pieces. So the, the pieces are as follows. This lambda is what Rafferty calls a, a volume parameter, scaling parameter. It just tells how, uh, how big you want these um, ellipsoids. Uh, the Ds are rotation matrices. So that's going to rotate these ellipses. We're going to ignore those for now. You'll notice the, only the bottom four allow for rotated ellipses. Um, the A determines the shape of the ellipse. So let's now um, kind of go through what these things mean. Uh, I, I should note one thing. K-means is going to assume equal priors, and it's going to assume that all of these covariance matrices are spherical and homoscedastic in a very strong sense. So homoscedastic in that all the clusters have the same variance and the variance is, is the same in all directions. So let's go try to understand these. Uh, I'm going to start out with the first of these two models. This is called the EII and the VII model. So what are these all about? Well, the covariance matrix, let's you know, just stick with, um, with two variables is assumed to look like this. It's a lambda k times i. So this is what the covariance matrix looks like. The inverse then is going to be 1 over lambda times the identity as well. So this technically is the VII model. Um, if you want EII, what we're going to do is make lambda k just lambda. So drop the subscript um, and you get the EII model. So, so what does this look like? Well, let's, um, let's go look at the contours. Go watch the bivariate normal video if you haven't already um, to understand what, what I mean by these contours. But um, the crucial part is this quadratic form. And so the quadratic form is, is, again, what showed up in the exponent here, the bivariate normal. So we're going to just kind of, th th this is what's going to give rise to the contours, is that, uh, that quadratic form. So let's examine that. What does the quadratic form look like when we have this as our sigma inverse? Well, it turns out that it's going to look something like this. x1 squared over the constant plus x2 squared over some constant, which... If we multiply through by that constant, we end up with x1 squared plus x2 squared. We recognize that as a circle. So it's a circle with radius c lambda sub k. Now, what's the difference between EII and VII? I like to draw some pictures. EII says that the clusters look like this. So they're all round and Moreover, they all have the same radius. Okay, so that lambda sub k is just lambda. So, so the contours for cluster k are just c lambda, and that's the same across all cluster k's. VIIs allow different radii. So some of these can be more homogeneous, others more dispersed. Okay, so, you know, in, in essence, EII is what you know, k-means implicitly assumes with one additional twist. The additional twist is that these um, Gaussian mixtures allow unequal priors, whereas k-means has a bias towards equal size clusters. So, you know, it's, it's a slightly more complicated, this EII is slightly more complicated than k-means because of the unequal priors. But 
other than that, it's about the same. Well, let's move on and look at the next four. So EEI, VEI, EVI, and VVI. Let's um, to keep our subscripts to a minimum, consider this form. So our covariance matrix sigma is going to be lambda times a. Now a was described as a diagonal matrix. So I'm going to represent this as diagonal elements a1 and a2. This is easily inverted. We can see the inverse over to the right. Now um, if we um, you know, if we want to, the other models are going to allow different lambdas or different i's across segments. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, so let's go find the contours. So the contours are going to be determined by that quadratic form. And if we look at this, what we end up with is the equation of an ellipse again. So I can multiply both sides by c lambda. Um, and then over here we have an ellipse. So the major and minor axes are you know, determined by A1 and A2, and then those get scaled by C lambda. So let's now um, see what happens. Um, we've got two parameters in this. So the volume parameter and the shape parameter. And we can either allow the volume parameters uh, to vary across clusters, or we can assume that they're constant across all clusters, likewise with the shape parameters. And that's how we end up with these four models. So I've drawn some more pictures. Um, e, e, I, so this means equal volume, equal shape, and then I means aligned with the coordinate axes. So all of these ellipses are aligned with one of the coordinate axes. The point here is they all have the same orientation. They're all sort of elongated in a vertical direction. Um, so that's equal shape. That's the second E. The first E is the, is the same volume. So they're all the same size. What about EVI? So EVI means, well, equal volume. So these three all have the same volume, if you will. Uh, however, we're going to allow different shapes. So this one has a, you know, is, is elongated in the horizontal direction. These are elongated in the vertical direction, and that's fine. As long as they're all, um, you know, aligned with the coordinate axes. Now, what is VEI? VEI says, uh, well, variable volume, but the same, you know, or in a shape. So notice they're all elongated in the vertical direction. So they're all the same shape, it's just that some are bigger than others. Finally, VVI means, well, they can have different volumes and different shapes. Now you, get, you have the ability to choose these uh, parameters. So let's just go back uh, and look at this. Here are all our models. Uh, what happens in the last four models is that we add a rotation matrix. So this allows you to rotate the ellipses. Now, this first model assumes that the rotation is the same across all ellipses. Whenever you have a D sub K, that means every cluster can have its own rotation. Now, let's go over to R, and I'm going to fit this model. So fit equals, what is, what is it? Uh, M plus NP2 and let's say g equal to 5. Now, it takes R um, a, a couple seconds to estimate this model on my machine. If I plot fit, here's what we get. Um, here we get the different models that have been tried for the five components, and clearly the EEV model fits best. Uh, these models don't do so well. Now, the EEV, by the way, is what we saw here. So I think this is overfitting in a sense. That uh, I think there's a little too much flexibility in this model. So let's go back to R. We can see the other. That's exactly what we had. Now, if we wanted to fit a simpler model, for example, 
um, I'm going to add in model names equals, for example, EII. Now, this EII is going to constrain the fit um, to have equal volume and then spherical clusters. So let's plot fit. And so I've, I've only got one model. Uh, now you'll see that each of these is round and roughly of the same uh, diameter and actually exactly the same diameter and we can see the uncertainty and so forth. Now if I, if I look at fit dollar parameters, and let's just walk through this. Here you have your mixing proportions. You'll find that those are quite similar to k-means. Here are the actual means. So the, this is your non-reader segment, your lights, your heavies, and then you got your skimmers and your selectives. If we look at our covariance matrices. This is the covariance matrix for cluster 1. This is the one for cluster 2. You note that they're all identical. Okay, so why is that? It's because I've used EII. So that means equal uh, across uh, clusters. You'll notice that they're diagonal matrices and that the variances are the same. Okay, so that's due to the EII model. At the bottom we'll see that uh, the key parameter, which is this volume or scaling parameter, is uh, summarized. So that's what that scaling parameter is. All right, so hopefully you have um, you know, some idea of, of how we can modify the complexity of these models using uh, these model names. Now, as you increase, as you go down, you use more parameters and the model becomes more complex. Um, a good exercise is to think about the number of, you know, total number of parameters estimated by each of these models. And what you'll find uh, is, is that, you know, it, it grows as you go down. And it grows quite quickly as a function of both K and P. Okay, so P is the number of predictors that you have. Now think about one of these, these covariance matrices when you have uh, more than two variables. You know, so with two variables, you have a two by two. If you had five variables, you'd have like 15 parameters in your covariance matrix. If you had 10 variables, my goodness, you're up to like 55 parameters, okay, per covariance matrix. Now, um, then these also tend to go up with K. So my, my suggestion is, if you have a fairly large um, number of predictors, you want to use a fairly simple model, like one of these top ones. Don't get down here where you got uh, where you've got a lot of parameters. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's it for my introduction to Gaussian mixtures.